international jihadist movement has declared war. They have declared war and already are uh, executing it on a massive scale on a whole range of countries with which they are in contact. Harsh words today from the Prime Minister about the rising acts of violence carried out by those with extreme ideologies. Yesterday's brutal attack in Paris has reignited the debate about what's driving what the Prime Minister called a global jihadist movement and what might be done to mitigate the threat. Now, in France, there have already been some incidents of backlash against some Muslims and mosques in the wake of the attack, as the French ambassador spoke about. And they've also got the rise politically of the Front National, the National Front with Marie Le Pen, a party rising in the polls that is very anti-immigration and has said very anti-Islamic things. What's causing the culture clash? Should there be limits on either publishing cartoons or 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 should there be limits on other things, or no limits at all? Is this just the exercise of free expression or adding fuel to the fire? There are lots of debate going on in France right now. We're going to get a couple different perspectives on what's happened and the fallout. Listening in from Toronto, and I'll speak to him in a minute, is the director of the Canadian Arab Federation, Mohamed Al-Rashidi. He's going to come on the program in a minute. But I want to bring in Mark Stein first. He's the best-selling author and commentator, author of Lights Out, Islam, Free Speech, in the Twilight of the West. He joins me in Manchester New Hampshire, uh, Mark, uh, good to have you back on the program. Uh, obviously, an outspoken advocate of freedom of the press and free speech. You've written about this. You've written about the situation in France before. What was your reaction when you heard about the Charlie Hebdo attack? Uh, well, I, I was devastated. Uh, there were basically only two publications uh, in the major Western nations uh, that published the Danish Mohammed cartoons after a bunch of people uh, had gotten killed o over them. Uh, the, the only two publications to republish them were Charlie Hebdo in Paris uh, and the magazine I was then writing for in Canada, the Western Standard. Uh, and so uh, these poor guys at Charlie Hebdo had to bear a burden uh, that should have been more widely dispersed. Uh, it's one thing to say these, these Mohammed cartoons from Denmark are lousy, they're not funny, uh, I don't want to publish them if you're the cartoon editor of The New Yorker. But once they're a news story and people are being killed over them, uh, then all this sort of pixelating Mohammed's image as if he's entered the witness protection program is frankly pathetic. And I, I was devastated that these brave guys uh, in Paris... Uh, had stood up for almost nine years to threats of death uh, and were finally taken out. And just to tie it back in uh, to what you were talking about earlier, the, the reason there wasn't a death toll like this at the Canadian Parliament is because uh, Kevin Vickers understood in a split second what was going on and prevented them, prevented that guy from ramping up the same kind of corpse count. And so you can, in a, in a military and policing sense, operate on that kind of trigger, whereby you, you, uh, you're alert to, uh, to, to, to military and security threats. But it's a much broader cultural issue, I think, uh, where this question will, will really eventually be settled. Let's talk about the cultural issue. Because uh, there's lots of concerns here. One, one concern it will rise, there'll be a, a rise in Islamophobia in France. 8% of the population is Muslim there. There's a concern that far right political parties like the Front National will use a xenophobic agenda to gain power. What is your concern about that in France or in Europe? Well, you know, every time we hear this uh, Muslims fear backlash thing, uh, in, in the Sydney co coffee shop in, uh, incident a couple of weeks before Christmas, uh, they'd launched the Muslims fear backlash storyline before the hostage siege in the coffee shop had ended. There was a parody headline after the July 7th tube bombings in London a decade ago uh, that went uh, that somebody put up on the internet Muslims fear backlash over tomorrow's train bombing uh, and in fact the backlash does not really happen because actually the citizens of Western nations have been very accommodating and very welcoming 
of immigrants. The question, though, is whether, in return, those immigrants are willing to accept the burdens of a pluralistic society. It doesn't mean that everybody wants to open up an AK-47 on you, Evan, but it does mean fellas like Ali Salim. You were talking about Ireland uh, a couple of minutes ago. Ali Salim is a professor at Trinity College, Dublin. And he has threatened the Irish press with taking them to court if they republish any of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. So he's not picking up a gun, but nor is he willing to be a fully functioning member of a Western society. You know, people talk about this, and this debate is happening in France. Uh, but, you know, the facts are, and I just wanna, I want your reaction to this, 8% of the population in France is, is, is Muslim. Uh, there is a, a genuine problem that, that about, mm. they have a different philosophy. We have a multicultural society in Canada. They have a more assimilation uh, issue there. But they've had a real issue uh, of integration and a genuine issue. But you've been on the forefront of saying there's a concern about uh, Islamic society taking over Europe when many people have pointed out there's actually no evidence of that. I'll just say, a re you know, the study like religiousness and fertility among European Muslims by demographers Charlie Westoff and Thomas Frejka say that, in fact, you know, there's no yeah. Muslim families have no more children than non-Muslim families. So there's no real fear of the kind of thing that you've stoked. And, and people have pointed to someone like you of, of raising fears that are unjustified about this. Well, you know, uh, there, there's studies and there's studies. What's fascinating is the first Pakistani immigrants uh, to the United Kingdom in the 1960s uh, adjusted to uh, British-style birth rates. And then after, as their numbers grew, uh, they resumed uh, something closer to Pakistani birth rates. Uh, Tunisians uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, actually have children at a higher rate than Tunisians in Tunisia. So there's all kinds of evidence for that. And, you know, Evan, you and I have been back and forth on this several times, and we can meet in 20 years' time at your favorite falafel restaurant on the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré and see who's right. But you cannot... What is hard to deny... Uh, you said 8% uh, of the population of France is Muslim. It's actually probably closer to 10%. Uh, but, the, but the fact is that as a society becomes more Muslim, uh, certain self-segregating elements set in. And that is what has happened in, in France, uh, where it's not like having Slovenes and Filipinas and all kinds of other people all jumbling up together and integrating, but in fact a, a consciously self-segregating bloc. That's, by the way, why Pakistan is not part uh, of an independent India, because they wanted to be a self-segregating bloc too. But uh, so, we, so there. there is an issue here, and, and uh, whether it's uh, 15 or 20 percent, once you get the popular an Islamic population up to a certain size, uh, it poses certain cultural challenges on things like freedom of speech. All right, we had a little delay here, so it's difficult for you and I to go back and forth. But let me just challenge you on a couple of statistics. Is it eight or ten percent? The, the French ambassador was on this program earlier. Mm. He said eight percent. Stats I've seen: France is eight percent. Slightly more than four percent of Europe overall is defined as Muslim by demographers. So when you say we could quibble about fifteen or twenty percent, uh, even by 2020, there's the, according to most demographic studies that I see, first of all, there's no chance of that, uh, you know, maybe 8% uh, if it even doubles. That's mm. the first thing. The second thing is, what's wrong with meeting at a falafel joint? You use it as if that's a pejorative. Great. They're, they're, you know, what we've had in Canada and the United States and all over <laughs> Europe is immigrants come and most statistics have borne out that immigrants integrate on our economic benefits. And, and the, I guess my question fundamentally is, here we are in a very, yeah, in a very uh, just a second, in a very difficult moment because of what this horrific act. And, and, the, and the fear is that people will use this act to start stoking fears about the Muslim population. Uh, then lions are not, most of them have nothing to do with this and have condemned this kind of horrific attack and are, and are contributors peacefully to society. It's never a number. It's never a numbers game, Evan. By the way, though, if you want to, if you want to talk numbers, one in ten young, uh, one in ten births 
in the United Kingdom are to, to, to Muslims. The French ambassador who was on your show, by the way, his government doesn't uh, keep uh, statistics about religious faith. Uh, the Austrian uh, government does, and the Demography Institute there uh, has predicted that by the year 2040, uh, a majority of uh, Austrians under the age of 18 will be Muslim. Uh, just to go back to that British statistic, if one in ten of your young people is Muslim, then at the minimum you're looking at a 10 percent uh, Muslim population. But the, you know, I've got nothing against falafel if it was left at falafel. But freedom of speech is not uh, as universally desired as falafel. And that's the disturbing thing about that Trinity College professor I mentioned, Evan, that there is simply not the same uh, acceptance of, of intellectual inquiry uh, in the Muslim world. We all know this. And when you say, oh, the majority of Muslims don't want to do this and don't want to do that, we report the same story you do on your news station every week now. This is just this week's atrocity. A couple of weeks ago it was Sydney. A couple of weeks before that it was Ottawa. Uh, and, and the reason you have to keep protesting that Islam is a religion of peace every, uh, quite as often as you do is because uh, every couple of weeks somebody kills someone, someone blows up something, someone runs over a guy with a car in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu and as they're speeding off they're yelling Allahu Akbar. Yeah, and but, until but hang on. moderate <laughs> Muslims actually uh, are willing to do something about that, uh, we are right to put a big question mark over Islam's ability to function in pluralistic advanced society. Well, well be okay, and I, I know we've got Mohammed al-Rashidi listening, but, but the, I just want to pick up on something you just said. You, said. you made a generalization that I found real dangerous. You said, we know they're, quote, intellectually less curious. Now, first of all, I don't know how you'd say that. Second of all, I mean, look, there's lots of statistics. Five out of the last... 13 Nobel Prize winners were Muslim. I mean, I don't know where, I mean, this is the kind of generalization that becomes very dangerous. And, and I guess my, my, and I know this debate's going on in France politically and it's playing out, and I know well, it's, no, no, it's stylish Evan, to say it's that. politically incorrect, but I, I guess my point is generalizations like this about a billion people are difficult to justify. Hmm. Uh, well, I'll tell you where I got it from. I got it from the United Nations. They did a famous survey uh, five or six years ago uh, that discovered that more books are translated into Spanish every year than, are tr than have been translated into Arabic in the last thousand years. And that's why you and I can have this back and forth. And if the fellows who disagreed with Charlie Hebdo, Evan, had wanted to have this back and forth, I would have no problem with it. I've got no problem with anyone who wants to disagree with me, insult me, put me down, as your next guest is happy to do. But when I make a point and the other fellow's reaction is to reach for his scimitar and chop your head off, which was the reaction of the fellows who objected to the Shaoli Hebdo cartoons, then sorry, uh, that is an intellectually defective uh, culture. And until, and until uh, the death threats end, uh, then I'm on the side of the people who do the culturally insensitive cartoons and the provocative plays and the unacceptable novels because I'll take freedom of speech over the guy reaching for his scimitar any day of the week. And uh, you uh, know you would too, Evan. You yeah, know you would too. The problem is you're painting a caricature. Uh, uh, everyone would. And most Muslims would too. This is the problem. Nobody is condoning going into a, a magazine like Charlie Hebdo and gunning down cartoonists. And, and there's, I have not heard any mainstream Muslim imam do the same thing. So my point here is not that anyone's justifying massacres, horrors, and murder. No one does. My, I guess my, my concern is that these, these terrorists, these psychopaths that try to justify that. By the way, the same way Andres Brevik did it when he did his horrible massacre and called himself mm. a Christian soldier. And did we have Christian right. ministers going out there saying we're concerned about Christianity? No, he was dismissed as a psychopath. Well, I, I, I think the way to look at the reaction here, um, you, you say nobody's condoning this. But people are reacting to it, and their reaction is one of fear and cowardice. Like, uh, for example, the cartoon in the National Post. 
uh, this morning by Gary Clement, one of my old colleagues from the National Post days. And, uh, and it's like all the cartoons expressing solidarity uh, with the dead around the world. They're cowed, they're craven, uh, they're not addressing the central issue, which is that these guys were killed because they did a cartoon of Mohammed. Uh, and the way to stop people being killed uh, for cartooning Mohammed is for everybody to reprint those cartoons. But Gary Clement wouldn't acknowledge right. that in the National Post this morning, nor did the cartoonists in the United States, nor the United Kingdom, nor Australia, nor Europe, nor all over the world. We're sending the message, uh, we're incentivizing violence. Uh, and there's no reason for anybody to apply yeah. pressure to stop violence because we are rewarding these people with violence. These were very brave men who died. And the people, and, and, and the, and, and the people who affect solidarity with them all under this absurd hashtag, Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie, uh, don't have an ounce of the courage that those guys displayed and aren't willing to do what those guys did. And that is why we are incentivizing violence and more people will die. And that's the problem. More books will go unpublished. Right. Uh, more art exhibitions will be cancelled. More plays will never be produced. More films will never be be made. I, and listen, the debate about whether everyone should be showing those cartoons is a very legitimate debate in defense of free speech, and no one's arguing this horrific attack on free speech is unjustifiable. Mark Stein, author of Lights Out, Islam, Free Speech, and The Twilight of the West, it's always good to have you on the program. Uh, you know, and, and as you and I both say, we champion debate where you know you're safe to engage in ideas. Sir, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure, Evan. Good to talk with you. That is uh, Mark Stein. All right. Now, listening into that discussion, I know these are passionate debates, and we always try to have passionate debates on power and politics. And that's the whole, well, listen, that is the beauty of our democracy. You're free to disagree with people and have different opinions, but you're safe to do so, which stands in stark contrast to what happened in France. But we've got Mohamed Al-Rashidi. He's been listening into Mark Stein. Here he is. And, uh, man, uh, he certainly got, he's certainly ready to respond. I know Mohamed Al-Rashidi, uh, director of the Canadian Arab Federation. He's next. Stay with us. Welcome back to Power and Politics. The manhunt for the two suspects in the Paris shootings yesterday continues right now out of Paris. We have no word as to how close the police might be to ending that. In the midst of that, there's a real conversation about the rise of extreme ideology and the acts of violence carried out uh, by some in the name of Islam, like the attack in Paris yesterday. Now, just before the break, we heard from the outspoken author and commentator Mark Stein. He says the media has a duty to publish those controversial cartoons that lampoon religion, and he says there is a politically correct debate that uh, is preventing us from having a real debate about immigration and about the religion of Islam. Some have accused him of trying to incite uh, xenophobia. Uh, listening into that conversation has been someone you've seen regularly on this program, and, and we wanted to get his perspective on, is there a, glowing, a growing culture clash in France, and what about what Mark Stein just had to say? In Toronto is the, Canadian, is the director of the Canadian Arab uh, Federation, Mohamed Al-Rashidi, and uh, Mohamed Al-Rashidi, uh, thanks, of course, for being here. You were here yesterday as well. Uh, Mark Stein, on the other side of the break, had a very passionate debate and his views about what he calls the Muslim issue, the problem in Europe. And, and, and of course, many people find some of those words uh, controversial. Or where are you on what he said? Yes, Evan, thank you for having me on and for, uh, for giving different sides uh, of this argument. I think that's very important. We're obviously very fortunate to, uh, to be in Canada where, where this sort of thing happens. Uh, too many countries, and, and to some extent even France, doesn't allow this type of debate where you get to hear the different sides. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm glad that we're, we're doing this. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the rise of Islamophobia, there's no question that you're going to have that as a reaction. There, there are bigots everywhere, and really they look for excuses to respond. Uh, with, with violence uh, to, to these sorts of things. We've seen bombings uh, of, of mosques and other Muslim targets in France, and, and we have that uh, throughout many countries, not just in France, certainly in Europe, uh, to a lesser extent in the United States and to an even lesser extent in Canada. Uh, I think leadership is very important from the top to address uh, Islamophobia and the attacks that uh, result from, uh, from these kinds of actions by uh, by 
um, religious extremists and uh, and terrorists. So th that's sort of the, the the first point. And obviously, the the actions, as as I said yesterday, Evan, it's important to reiterate that they're barbaric, and there's no justification whatsoever to carry out violence, let alone murder, against somebody that you, you disagree with. I, I, I can't underscore that enough. All right, and I think fair enough. Uh, there's widespread condemnation about this from all aspects. Uh, what do you make of what Mark Stein's saying about, um, you know, his point is that the there has no separation, he argues, between church and state in Islam. In other words, uh, that, the, that the tolerance for things like satire, like uh, depictions of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, that that causes this kind of horrific backlash. And he says there's not enough moderate Muslims are, are standing up for that. In the same way, for example, satire of Jews or Christians, or look at Monty Python's The Life of Brian. Uh, y y that kind of stuff is tolerated, and yet uh, a cartoon about the Prophet Muhammad isn't. His view is there. There's a difference, and we shouldn't be afraid to talk about that. Yeah, but you know, you 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 raise really good points with with comments like the Muslim problem. I, as somebody who who studied race relations and and is aware of the history, certainly of Europe, in relation to minorities, when I hear something like the Muslim problem, I can't help but think of going back to the 1800s and and the mid 1900s and what happened to Jewish communities there with the Jewish problem. And so it's very frustrating to see uh, essentially over time uh, musical chairs being played by minority groups, one replaced after the other, when the lesson should be that racism and discrimination are wrong, period. It shouldn't be okay to one day discriminate against one group and then switch to another. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the numbers game that I, that I keep hearing and, and how Europe is becoming Muslim and and, and you made a good point about the falafel stand. I don't understand really what are we getting at when we say that uh, we, we have a problem and that a country is becoming Muslim. Is that so? Do you want to sterilize Muslims? Do you want to ban mixed marriages? I mean, what arguments are we well, getting let me, at? Here? Well, let, it's a very now, slippery Tony slope. Blair, uh, th this is fascinating. We had this debate here in Quebec when on, under the PQ they talked about a charter of values. You had uh, Tony Blair. Uh, in in the UK and even to a certain extent David Cameron and they're talking about values and then this is this is touchy stuff but some countries believe they have certain values and this is this whole program and in France is a, is a fascinating example they are open about quote assimilating to what are French values the debate we had in Quebec which was so controversial is how it is it passed out as you know under Sarkozy in France what do you make of that is there, is there a dark side to that yeah, there's a, there's a very dark side. Okay, so there's a difference in values. Is somebody telling me that my values are somehow different than another person because of, I don't even know, because of my genetics or because of, of what exactly? And, and you know, I, I, we, sh we need to flush that out. I think it's a healthy debate to have. We need to flush that out more. I, I've been practicing law for, uh, for, what, over 10 years now. Is somebody saying that Muslims commit more crime than non-Muslims? Because I haven't seen that in courtrooms. Uh, that I've been in. I don't see the docket overwhelmingly representing one group more than the other. It's a reflection of society and other different factors. It, it, is that the argument that, that, that some people are more violent than others as a result of, uh, you know, it, it gets very, very touchy, as you say. Um, I reject it outright, and I think uh, specific examples need to be brought forward so that we can address them. But these generalizations are very troubling. What about when he says, what about, again, I'm going back to what Stein says what about when he says we don't hear enough condemnation of violence and radicalism from uh, uh, moderate imams now we've had a lot of imams on this program uh, and, and you know when, when, when a radical Christian or a radical Jew uh, or a radical Hindu performs an act of violence uh, you don't get that whole community saying you know they don't represent it it does happen for sure in, in, for the Muslim world and people, you know, media outlets go, oh, you know, let's try to have a better understanding of, uh, of Islam. But, but what's your sense of that? Is there a struggle within the religion of Islam, uh, you know, over who speaks for, what it represents? There are many sects, you know, it's not a monolith. Yeah, I and mean, you got over 1.6 billion people uh, who, who uh, associate with Islam, who call themselves Muslims. You've got 53 countries in the world who are majority Muslim, and then you've got uh, the rest of the Muslims spread out in, in, in various countries. So the most populous Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. 
um, and you know, and, and Arabs compose a, a small percentage of Muslims, less than 20 percent of Muslims around the world. It's very mixed, so it's very difficult as someone who's aware of the Muslim world to make generalizations, not only as unique individuals, but as nations spread out through continents. It, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that we can generalize about such a large group of people spread throughout the world. But to your point, um, I think that you, we have to sort of be careful when, when somebody yeah. comes at it from that point because, right. yes, Evan, you're saying? I got, I got 30 seconds and one of the points I just want you to answer just to make sure people get a, a, a fair response here. Stein on the other side, many people are tweeting that they don't like his views, some people do like his views, obviously very polarizing stuff. But at the end, he said, whatever you think, he believes that the world should be publishing the cartoons that were very controversial. First, the Danish cartoons uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, and then the cartoons, the satirical cartoons of Shali Hebdo. He thinks it's incumbent on media organizations to show all of those cartoons. Would you support the publication of those cartoons? No, Evan, Evan the, there's the, 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 the freedom of speech argument is a very tricky one, and I'm actually surprised that all of a sudden this has become about freedom of speech. We, what happened was wrong, violence will never be excused, but the freedom of speech argument is a sophist one. Uh, Charlie Hebdo actually fired Maurice Sinet uh, in 2010 because he uh, published a cartoon in Charlie Hebdo that was viewed as anti-Semitic. It attacked someone in power. It was Sarkozy's son. And he took him to court. They fired him. They told him either you write a letter of apology or not. He said, no, I would rather je préfère couper mes couilles. And, and he ended up getting fired and going to court. He eventually succeeded. But my point is, there are limits on freedom of speech, and you have to have good taste. And I think it's very important not to attack marginalized groups. This, is, this goes to the French argument of the situation in France. You have a group that's marginalized, that is suppressed and, and maligned in many ways. Anyone familiar with French society knows this. And so to pander to the majority at the expense of a, of a suppressed minority, you're bound to have a backlash. And it, it's not progressive. It doesn't help move things forward, aside from it being in bad taste. So when you have uh, things like uh, the Prophet Muhammad having a, a turban on his head in the shape of a bomb, that's not contributing anything. That is, that, that is contributing to the hatred of this group. And that trickles down Evan in society. You end up having, and this is what we deal with in our organization, you got people who can't find jobs despite being qualified and going to university. Why? Because of their backgrounds. When you start to spread these views in a society, the majority starts to shun this targeted group. Mm -hmm. And now I mean, you have the, a marginalized group and you got a problem. Uh, fair enough. I mean, this is a debate we're going to continue having. On the other side, there's free speech arguments that you defend the things that even you find repulsive yourself. Uh, on the other side, there's slander and there's danger. And so, uh, you know, societies are trying to balance this line. And, it, and it's, a, it's a real debate, obviously. Now we're talking about it uh, at a very sensitive time as we watch that situation in France. Mohamed al-Rashidi is the director of the Canadian Arab Federation. Uh, he's on this show regularly. Great to have you on the program, uh, responding to Mark Stein before the break. Uh, fascinating debate. I always appreciate you, having, you coming on the show. Thanks. Thanks, man.